and welcome to today's first and final episode of Culture in the 808. My name is Jarnell Hopala, and I'll be your host for today. So hey, come follow me. We're going to head out to Kaneohe today for this episode because we would like to introduce you to a crop that is quite popular throughout the Pacific but hasn't really established the same notoriety here in Hawaii. So how are we going to do this? We're going to go ahead, we're going to visit my backyard where I've got this bad boy growing besides other beautiful things in our garden. I'd also like to introduce you to some useful information about this crop and kind of understand why it's not so popular here. Last but not least, I'd also like to prepare for you this awesome Tongan dish that's called Lupulu. It's so delicious. So stay tuned. And here it is, folks. This is the name of the anonymous crop I was talking about. It's called Abel Moscus Manahat. It's known by so many other names throughout the Pacific. There's over 200 known names, and that's based on the different tribes that exist throughout the Pacific region. For me, we call it, well, as the Tongans would call it, it's, we name it Pere. And here in Hawaii, it's normally called the edible hibiscus. It's also been known as the sunrise hibiscus. And as already you can tell, um, you see the, you hear the word hibiscus in it. It is a member of the Malvasi family, which is, yep, the hibiscus. All right. So welcome to my backyard and um, most of these pictures come from my backyard and we're looking at one variety of the Abel Moscus Manahat. Um, this is my favorite one. I prefer this one and it's more common in my garden than the other variety, although they're both good. I really like using this one. I use most of it in cooking. Actually, I prefer it. Uh, this variety, as you can see, it's green, green stemmed. And in the bottom middle photo, and I'm so sorry for this, is a picture of its flower. It's a real beautiful, bright, showy flower. It's almost fluorescent. It's also edible. Um, with this, the leaves, yes, the leaves are edible. And mainly that's what um, the Polynesians like to use is that leaf. And here we've got the other variety, which is uh, purple. As you can see by that stem in the top right corner, it's really dark purple, beautiful. Um, as you can see, a little variation in the, sh um, the leaf. I guess you could say it's shininess and not as veiny as the other variety that we were looking at. Um, both of them can be eaten raw or cooked. And then I'll demonstrate that to you later in, uh, in an, um, further down the line. Anyway, um, let's let's begin with some information about these guys. Like, let me tell you some things about um, their uses. So, from different parts of the world, uh, the juice of the bark is used for cuts and wounds. Um, the squeezed roots are used for uh, sprain or injury uh, sprain relief. Um, that mucilage, that sticky extract uh, that's present, like okra, um, is crushed and soaked, and it's used to remove uh, remove dew. Um, dirt during the preparation of jewel, which is in Africa. Um, the fibers from the stem can be used to uh, make uh, ropes and slings. The leaves and shoots can be cooked in a soup for colds, sore throats, stomach aches, and dysentery. Also, let me mention diarrhea. Some other interesting facts is that in Japan, the roots are used to make paper. Uh, in temperate Europe, these are actually considered uh, ornamental shrubberies that people love to grow. And some other things, um, in Polynesia, um, the leaves are from the tree itself. Um, they're used to reduce abortion. I know it sounds a little trippy. Um, the mucilage of the extract is used, to, uh, used for constipation. It's also been noted that uh, the Abel Moscus Manahat is used in for the ease of childbirth to stimulate milk production, and also to shorten menstrual cycles. So these are just some of the uh, medicinal uses. But for its nutritional facts, there is so much out there and still yet more to be discovered. We do know already that it is high in vitamin A and C. It's a good source of magnesium, sodium, potassium, and calcium. Being that it's high in protein, um, you know, there are uh, different countries, not 
not as developed. Like I know Tonga is a poor country, and that's where my dad is from. And you know they used it uh, when there was a lack of meat because it was such a good protein source. When there was no meat available, this was the source to use. In other parts of Polynesia, they use it. Some of them don't appreciate the greenery as much, and they use it for feed um, on pigs. So here's a little information that I wanted to share um, on these guys. But something else is, why is it not so popular in Hawaii? And it could be um, just a lack of communication, letting it get known out there. It is known as the other spinach. And for us in Hawaii, there is some sentimental, um, sentimental, sen sentimental value with the taro, which does hold some essence in the Hawaiian culture. Um, those leaves have been highly prized here and usually are more commonly used here. So they seem to be more preferred. But if we could boost the integrity levels about this neglected crop, we definitely can inspire some curiosity. I am well aware that tests are going on um, internationally um, where they're trying to find cures for depression anti-convulsions, um, a preventative effect on the, on they're using lab rats right now to test for inflammatory diseases. So there's much, there's things that are slowly going on out there. It is slowly catching We feel lucky to be at the forefront of this. And without further, any further delay, folks, let's get to that awesome dish I was telling you about. It's the Tongan dish called Luke Pulu. Now here on the table, you see, we've got um, to my left, a bowl with about 18 leaves of the pere or Abel Moscas Manahut, cleaned by washing and removing the stems. I've got three cans of New Zealand corned beef, one onion, a can of coconut milk and of course a lovely pot to combine all the ingredients in. Okay, so in the pot that I have heated up on uh, roughly medium heat, I'm going to add the three cans of the New Zealand corned beef. And yes, please use New Zealand corned beef, not Libby's. It really makes a difference and um, I prefer using that. It tastes better. And over here, you can see I've already added up that onion. I've rough chopped it, and I've also added it in after the five minutes of cooking the corned beef. Um, right here, I'm going to go ahead as well and add in the one can of coconut milk. Uh, I actually prefer the traditional method, which is made by husking the coconut um, and traditionally squeezing out the juice by shredding the meat. But, you know, that's, that's a lot of work. So anyway, we'll use the canned coconut milk. Um, you can add more if you like. Go ahead and cover it, and we're going to let it sit for about 10 minutes. Um, after that 10 minutes, let's go ahead and grab those um, pere leaves. And you can rip them up smaller, but I like mine big. I like them to look chunky in the, in the mixture. So I leave them big. Go ahead and cover the pot and let it sit for, what, 10 minutes. Once 10 minutes is done, Voila, there you go. That's it. And hey, I'm so sorry on the lighting of this, but um, yeah, this is the finished product and you can serve it with rice, taro, any starch. It's really up to you. And this officially concludes this episode of Culture in the 808. Dr. Amen, thanks for putting up with this video and hanging in there throughout it. Um, bear with the technical difficulties. I've never used this before, so thanks so much for your patience and didn't mean to hold you hostage too long. Other than that, if you have any questions, let me know. Other than that, take care.